Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Varsity Club Lacrosse Podcast presented by Focus on the Field. Now, Focus on the Field is an administrative service provider focused on youth sports organizations. They offer a fully outsourced turnkey solution to the administrative burden facing administrators, coaches, and volunteers. They offer multiple services through administration, communication, registration, and technology. The Focus on the Field team has extensive experience in youth services and parent engagement with a deep understanding of the nuance involved in driving a positive experience. This combined with years of industry knowledge in youth sports has enabled Focus on the Field to become the modern solution in optimizing youth sports administration. All right, now back to the episode. Hello and welcome to the Varsity Club Lacrosse Podcast, the world's greatest club lacrosse podcast. My name is Brian Plunkett. With me, co-host Sam Criscola. Sam, how's it going, man? I'm honest, Brian. Not a great morning. Um, Slept on my friend's parents' couch last night. Um, Woke up, came here, and now I'm ready to go. But we're going to fire away on this. This is going to be a fantastic episode. I'm actually really excited. Yes, sir. I'm super excited about the interview. But to summarize today's episode, today we're going to discuss the newest news in the MCLA. Then we have an exclusive interview with the Boz. And finally, we have our New Year's resolutions for this year. So, Sam, what's going on around the MCLA? Yeah, we're going to start with something that I'm super excited about. Uh, I think this is a great uh, iteration, um, addition, whatever you'd like to say of lacrosse and specifically for mcla um so the mcla is hosting a alumni sixes tourney this year at round rock um and that's the mcla national championships presented by new balance and so they're gonna play i think presented um and i think it's gonna be maybe a day or two before the championship i think is what was happening there honestly not sure but the thing is you'll play those games and you'll get to watch the national championship or tournaments tournament games. Um, so I think that's honestly so awesome. And they're thinking about the alumni, which God bless your soul MCLA. So there's a bit of details into it. I think it's May 10th, 11th, uh, have to pay $150 for a team registration fee, but then also you have to play seven, you have to pay $75 each, which is an interesting point there. Um, but yeah, I think for alumni, there's really not much opportunities to play in something like this. I feel like there's a lot of men's league teams, which I play in a men's league, but it's just like the most unorganized thing ever. And I think if this is going to happen, I think it's going to be very structured and it's going to feel like we were playing back in the day, especially wearing all of your old gear with your buddies you used to play with. I think that's so sweet. So I'm currently trying to get an Oregon team going, but we are light on goalies. So that's, that's where I'm stuck. But I think if we can find one, I think I might have to ask Boz to be our goalie. We'll see. We'll see if that works. Well, Uh, is this, are you trying to recruit anyone from the US, any alumni, or does it have to be from that program? I think it has to be from the program. Okay. And so that's our problem because I only played with, like really three goalies my entire career and they're all like not able to go so i don't know we're scrambling here but i i'm hoping to pull it off if they'll still have us but yeah i think that's like my dream honestly if i'm yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna be honest i would love to play again as an Oregon uh Oregon duck no doubt so i encourage everyone to look into it if you've got a bunch of buddies that would still love to play i think making a trip to austin or Dallas sounds pretty fun. I don't know which is closer to Round Rock. I'm assuming Round Rock ain't the greatest city in the world. Uh, but I think Austin or Dallas could be fun. So if you want to spend a, a weekend there, maybe a week, who knows? I think that'd be a cool idea. So shout out to the MCLA. I think that's really an awesome idea that they're doing. All right, Sam, what's next? We are going to the Pac-12 shootouts. All right, this is year 17 of this occurring, which... I feel like, you know, tradition kind of matters in sports and culture. And I think this is something like there's a bunch of these types of things in the MCLA, which 
I feel like it makes the MCLA have such rich culture. Um, but this is in UCL or at UCLA, and I I played this maybe three years, and I think the cool part about it is you get to play in UCLA's soccer field, stadium, whatever you like to call that. And, you know, it's got actual UCLA scoreboard. It's got stands. It's got a press booth. Um, so I think that's probably one of the better atmospheres I played at just because of the stadium, you know, was, was legit. You know, we weren't playing at our rec field or someone's grass field on the side. So very fun opportunity for those guys. Um, nice place to go. You can't complain visiting L.A. I mean, like, come on, mm-hmm. um, especially coming from Oregon. Uh, when it's rainy in the in February or March, whatever it is. So after that, yeah. though, we're gonna go to an, another tournament here. We got the Rocky Mountain Rumble, and I am pretty sure this is the first year this is happening. I've never heard about this. this is the first year, um, but we've got a few teams here. There's only six D two teams. We've got Air Force, Cal State, San Marcos, Missouri State, Montana State. North Dakota State and UC San Diego. And I'm going to get to Cal State San Marcos in a second here. But I think this is, again, a really cool opportunity to start growing some culture, especially within these teams, making some rivalries maybe. I'm not sure about the Rocky Mountain part because this doesn't look like the RMLC. But I think, you know, sometimes you just got to grab whoever you can grab. But another opportunity to just uh, play some play some teams every year, which I think – makes things pretty fun and then our last our last thing here is the vcl rankings varsity club lacrosse they've been coming out with uh, their top 10 in d3 d2 and d1 for their players and teams and right now i think we're at we just have d2 and d1 number one player um and so they've been killing it i think that's an awesome opportunity for players like this is what we're preaching, dude. Like, we just want exposure for for these um, these club athletes, and I think this is an awesome thing for everybody. Uh, like, imagine you're just like, and number nine, Sam Crisco. Like, I couldn't couldn't be me, obviously, but uh, <laughs> I think that would be so awesome. Like, just seeing your name up there. So, yeah, we've got two more. I was I was gonna name them all off, but there's they tweet so much. I just so hard. So yeah, no problem. I will bring back Cal, Cal State San Mar- Marcos because they have to have been paying VCL to get them on the board because I swear to God, there were six kids in the top 10. I don't know how that even happens, but um, shout out to them because if that's if that's real and you guys are the top six players this year, I think that's actually really cool. So but then there's a lot of heat on you to win that win that natty. So. Uh, yeah, just a good opportunity to get your name out there. So shout out to all those top 10s and those top 10 teams. Um, I'm going to say I think the number one is the kid from Virginia Tech. And if it's not, then there's something wrong in the world because that kid is disgusting at lacrosse. But also number two was a Michigan transfer. And I'm really excited to see how that turns out for Texas. Um, I think they've got a really good team. And that just adds to some firepower there. So. Yep, that's the top 10. Good luck to all those teams this year. Um, good luck that's to everybody be, in the MCLA. Good luck to everybody in and outside of the MCLA. It's Except be, the teams I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tim. That's the news roundup. Thank you so much for gathering up all that information. Up next, we have our second segment, which is a legendary interview with the boss, Austin. Oh, can, can, I just, can I just say something right here? Yeah, I think I know we've already recorded this this uh, second segment. And I know this is going to be the, like the best podcast we're ever going to have because Boz is the man. Yeah, He is so knowledgeable. He's so nice. He's so positive. I think this is going to be beneficial for everyone listening. And yeah, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Great guy. All right. And with that, here's the interview. Introducing a Eugene, Oregon native, former immovable object at UO, a current assistant coach at UO, and the most loving person on earth, 
Austin Boz Bosworth. Welcome in, Boz. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dragon and Uno, <laughs> my two favorite lacrosse podcasters. Oh, it's just I'm too good. so grateful to be on. Thank you so much for uh, tapping me on that long guest list to jump jump in and talk lax with you guys. I really appreciate it. I love you, Nighthawk. For those for those awesome. listeners out there, I hope you can uh, understand the reference. If not, hope you comment can below what you think it is. All you listeners, you know what's good for shoulder pain. <laughs> this is just going to be quotes the entire time, movie quotes. That's all I am. I'm yep. references and just and just slinging jokes. That's all. I and am. that's okay. <laughs> that's that's all we need. Uh, Boz, I think we're just going to start off like kind of we normally start off, but. You know, I think you've got a very interesting background, um, and I think a lot of people can relate through just being club lacrosse. You know, a lot of shit doesn't go your way, um, whatever that may be. And I think everybody would benefit from hearing about how you grew up in lacrosse and everything and how that's blossomed into what it is now. Of course, I'll try to keep this as short as possible. You know, I've got a nice little essay here, but, you know, my roots with lacrosse started with my dad. He uh, picked up the game in Virginia when he was in high school, um, carried it through college. He was a University of Oregon alum and played for the club team in the 90s and then went on to play in the local men's league, was called the Nutria, which I think is a pretty cool name. Um, and so I picked up my stick really young, playing catch with him. The first chance I had to play uh, organized lacrosse was in fourth grade. It was the Players Club Experience Camp uh, run by the current Oregon coach then. Um, and it was a really awesome experience because I was playing with like middle schoolers. I was playing around high schoolers. And so from a very young age, I could see the progression that I was going to go through in the next few years and what I could work on to really become better as a player. And that's really not the case for a lot of people in Eugene, unfortunately. It's not a huge hotbed for lacrosse. We do have a number of high schools that play organized lacrosse, but it's unfortunately not quite as popular as uh, Portland or even um, Seattle. Seattle has a much, much stronger uh, foundation for lacrosse. Um, I uh, played EVYL, Emerald Valley Youth Lacrosse, during middle school, um, and then I went on to play for Marist here in Eugene. And then for college, I actually decided to go back east, um, and I went to Holy Cross out in Massachusetts, and I played club with them. Um, and that is a nickel team, an NCLL league team, and so I was able to play the full four years, well, three years because I was off campus my junior year, but played three years with them, had an awesome time. Came back to Oregon um, after graduation, met a girl, uh, bought a place, not bought, but started renting, you know, the classic uh, Zillennial struggle um, <laughs> and uh, was working for a few years and was like, this just isn't clicking and went back to grad school um, to study public administration, nonprofit management. Um, and through that, I thought to myself, hey, it's always been a dream to be a part of the Oregon Club Lacrosse program. You know, I, I'm a little long in the tooth, but why don't I go try out, see how it goes? Um, and I instantly gelled with the upperclassmen there and the culture that they had with the team. Um, made it through several tough rounds of cuts um, on my personality alone. I'm, I'm fully believing in that <laughs> fact for sure. Um, even though I wasn't behind those closed doors, I know what that kind of conversation was like. Hey, um, sometimes that's all. And you I had an to... absolute... <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Sometimes it's just that foot in the door. Um, mm -hmm. I had an absolutely electric year with the guys. I uh, played some face off. I got a few reps. My claim to fame, though, is uh, during the PNCLL championship. Game, this shit is lit. The, this is um, my favorite moment the, um, ever playing you know, lacrosse. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to take a pause from my roots really quick to talk about this story and I'm not going to be too controversial with it. But there was a hit on our goalie in the third quarter. Goalie was not happy with it. Those hands were not together on that hit in the upper chest. Um, for me as a high school ref, I saw a cross check, but hey, you know, college game, it's a fast paced game. Maybe the ref was following the ball. Not my problem. Uh, our problem was the fact, though, that the, the goalie had choice words for the ref um, and told him that was a cross check. And uh, the ref decided it was within his purview to send our goalie to the box for a full minute. We tried to get uh, an at-home player to sit, but they were saying, nope, it's a personal. So uh, I ripped my jersey off, ripped my shoulder pads off, threw his sh chest pad on, uh, grabbed his gloves and his helmet, ran in there with no warm-up. And uh, I'm going to be honest, first one flew right by me. You know, yep. it was 14 <laughs> yards out. They had some room. They took it. I was going to have to cross the goal to get to it with a with a with you know an off-stick save. So nice shot on the first one. Second one, again, not going to lie, didn't see it a bit, but it bounced off that left foot. 
So I was one for two on saves in the season uh, and was able to jump in there and keep our team, you know, in the in the competition. We were at that point um, nursing a lead. And unfortunately, Boise State was able to tie it up. And then in fourth overtime, they closed it out and were able to head to Texas uh, and take our place that year, which was a tough loss, a tough way to uh, end that season. Um, that was the end, I think, at least, uh, of my uh, collegiate MCLA playing career because the following year I saw how competitive tryouts were going to be. I didn't feel like my body was right quite where I wanted it to be. So I said to the the officers that were coming up, hey, would you be interested in me as a coach potentially, as more of a, a coach role than a player? And they said, hey, let's try it out. Let's jump at it. Um, and I was really gracious to them for for welcoming me in. At that same time, they had a new coach, uh, Coach Dan Merritt, coming in, and he had a completely new vision for the program, and he welcomed me into his, his vision as well. And I was able to take on a couple of different roles. I was the face-off coach. I was the transition coach. I was the uh, omitties lines coach during games. If we didn't have a parent to run stats, I was running stats for the team. My camera was the run, running was the run doing film um, and all that fun stuff. And so I try to just be a jack of all trades and really fill in wherever there's a need um, to make sure that these guys get as much of an opportunity to play the play on the field as they can. Because that memory is still fresh for me. I know how important it is to make sure that everything is in place for that time when you're on the field. Because like Sam has said in previous episodes, these games feel like five minutes, man. When you're playing in them, they're like. They're like that. They're over so fast. And so making sure that they've got all the preparation ready to be able to go out there and play. That's how I'm going to generate that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, um, that joy and experience of watching them play, like being able to say, Hey, I did help with, with making that happen, that win or that, that goal. Um, so that's where, that's where the joy is with coaching now. Um, and, you know, I've got to say coaching is tough on, uh, on the home life. You know, I wouldn't be able to do any of this for the past, this, the previous season or this season as a current assistant coach couldn't couldn't do it at all without my wife Kelsey at home taking care of the dogs taking care of those tasks at home that really frees up my ability to go to practice five days a week and travel with the team um because it to me it is such a privilege and a gift to be able to do this with these guys and be in a position of of leadership um and I want to cherish it because I know it's not forever because you know I've got other things that uh that are on the roadmap like uh like human babies, less furry babies, um, and all that type of fun stuff. And so, you know, while I can, I want to get out there and, and give as much as I can because the sport has given me so much. Um, and so that's a bit about my story. One thing that I totally forgot to include, though, because it wasn't in my notes, was uh, a, a pretty transformative experience for me uh, in my freshman year of high school. When, or you know what, that wasn't actually freshman, it was my junior year. My dad reached out to a uh, native youth lacrosse program out in Burns, Oregon, which is in Eastern Oregon, and set up a friendly competition before the season. And uh, the Nodzit Saga came out with, um, with a, a creator's game prayer at the beginning of the game. And, you know, I had known a little bit about our, his about our history and our relationship with uh, the indigenous community and, you know, how that has gone. Um, and so, you know, I was a little bit cautious, like, how are they going to come into this place where it's a Catholic school, it's a bunch of privileged kids playing their sport, how are they going to feel? And they welcomed us in with open arms. And it was all of us joining hands in a circle in the middle of the field, praying to the creator, thanking them for this game. And I was like, wow, this game can do a lot more than just give me these bruises on my legs and make my hands smell so terrible. It can do more. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so that, that moment for me was like, wow, you know, there's a way for people to actually engage with cultures and communities that they don't even know that are just a few hours away through a sport that some people think is of as totally privileged and is totally white. Um, and I hope to really help to, 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 to combat that because, you know, I'm going to come at baseball a little bit, but this is America's pastime, my friends. This game was played thousands of years ago by the Iroquois Confederacy as a method of diplomacy to keep from going to war with each other. They played lacrosse, man. That is hardcore. They played with rocks. They used deer skin as strings. Man, this is metal. This is the real metal sport. And I think if more people had access to it, if more schools had gear to hand out to kids, and if there were more leagues, not only would there be less head injuries because less kids will be playing football, but people will be more in touch with their community and in touch with cultures that they haven't even had a chance to learn about. So I think that's one really cool thing about lacrosse that I don't hear about talked about all the time. Just wanted to call that out. No, and you're definitely right about that. I think even for myself and I'm 
you know, throw Brian in here. Like, I don't know a whole lot about it, honestly, about indigenous culture and how that even connects like with lacrosse. I know there's, you know, that baseline of they've played this for thousands of years and whatnot, and they started this and this is their game. But then it's like almost my knowledge is just like not there. So if I could ask, where could people go to figure out these types of things? Like, you know, everyone could just say Google and whatever, but like, do you have specific, I'm kind of throwing you on the spot here, but do you have specific places where people could go <laughs> to figure that out? No, thank you. I, um, I wish I could point to a book. I know there's a bunch of books on this topic. So I will say my first answer is Google, but mm -hmm. do it informed in an informed way. Like right. find a book if you're interested in sitting down with it, but also like the history channel has little articles on the sport there are little things that you can pick up um and you know one thing that i want to say is in this day and age politics is so divisive and the way you feel about politics can often paint your understanding of the present and also paint your understanding of the past and i think it's really important to find moments like this where you can look at facts about history and how they speak to you about what's happening today. And then it gives you a chance to understand your own narrative because everyone out there is trying to sell you a different narrative and make you feel a certain way because they want you to buy that anti, that after free, that aftershave or to buy that cologne or they're selling something to you. So always take every bit of information you get with a grain of salt, always look at the, 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 the author and the spin and like the, the incentive they would have to write that way. Because unfortunately, these days, truth is so bendable and so malleable. But going back to lacrosse, you can absolutely find some resources online that'll just tell you about the history of the sport, tell you about Deon Siguajes, uh, which means uh, they bump hips, um, which comes from the Onondaga Nation. Um, there are a lot of different communities that 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 uh, have cultural ties to the creators game. Um, and so you'll come up with a lot of... Um, a lot of different programs when you Google, but I would encourage listeners to put in their local community, like your city or your state, and then something like um, a native youth lacrosse program or or native lacrosse or, or something like that to try and find um, a local community that plays lacrosse um, and might have something to talk about it. Because I know for me, the Nonset Saga have a little bit of a website that talks about their history. Um, and so it gives me a chance to have a little bit of a cultural understanding for them um, before I even reach out. Um, and, you know, and this is something that's been in the back of my mind is, you know, how can MCLA teams also do this? Because I think that the, co the college landscape is a perfect place to question your beliefs, to question your, your thoughts and to question those opinions that you have. And one way to do it is to sit down with people that disagree with you. Um, and I'm not saying that we inherently disagree with the indigenous community, but I will say that they would obviously agree with me that there are places where we can respectfully talk about differences and how we would run things or how we would decide things. Um, so I think that I think that to answer your question, yeah, there are some some resources readily available. But if uh, if that story resonates with you, there are absolutely books out there to really dive into the story more. And I wish I could say that I've read those and could 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 call those out with by title. Um, but I know those are there as an option. Um, and a really quick also about this connection to the indigenous game. I think MCLA current players can also draw something from this traditional roots for the game. And that's that this is a, a medicine game. It's a game of healing. And it's also a game that should span generations and span time. So um, when I talk about, you know, the Oregon team now, um, I'll talk about effort goals and I'll talk about how that's going to drive our outcomes. Um, and those effort goals are short term and they're long term. And so seeing the game as a game given to us by the creator and given to us by these communities and seeing how it's a, a millennia long game, it gives you that perspective of um, I don't have to be focused on getting short term gains right now. I can focus on my development as a player over time, especially as a high schooler. If you think about uh, I think it's just as important to practice your philosophy for the game as much as you practice wall ball. You should practice how you think about you approach the field, how you approach um, talking to your opponents on the field. Um, because like not to get on too many tangents, but my opinion, whenever you're on the field, you should have your favorite classical music playing in your head uh, because you should be perfectly calm and serene because that's going to give you the perfect focus on those little tiny decisions you make during each game that are going to turn the outcome. So that was a very meandering answer to that question, but no, there is a awesome wealth enough. of information out there, but always be critical with what you're taking in, no matter what the source is, you always got to think to yourself, what are they gaining from it? Um, and what can you glean from it? And what can you really understand from their perspective? Yeah, I definitely think this should be on at least 
somewhat of people's minds, if not the forefront of it. Um, and I, I definitely feel bad about not having this type of knowledge and not us waiting till episode nine to bring this up, you know? Um, so I think I, and I that's pre- what I want. That's what I don't want people to feel. I don't want people to feel bad because ignorance is not, um, bad in and of itself it's when you weaponize it or when you use it to hurt other people so not knowing something is a perfectly innocent place to be and it's an awesome opportunity when someone says there's that world out there to learn about but also um just because i've i've done this before you should never feel bad or or put yourself down because you don't necessarily have the time or you don't take the choice to learn about that you know because everyone's got 24 hours in a day everyone's only got so much attention and energy they can put towards it um So I wouldn't want someone to be like, oh, someone else is doing more than me because I can get like that. And the comparison (laughs) game is just a thief for happiness. Comparison is the thief of joy. God, you are so positive, boss. That shit is crazy. (laughs) I I I didn't even have any coffee yet. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I just think it's it's like important for people to know, especially like this game is giving me so much, like way more than I ever expected. And I think learning like the actual roots of lacrosse and knowing what people have been through to keep this game going i think is very important and definitely something i'm gonna try and keep up with now at least maybe not keep up with but learn a bit more about it and i think what's awesome is um aiden skoken who was also on the pod um, not too long ago he's working with the pll and i feel like they're doing i think i think they're doing their part with getting um the indigenous culture out there at least with doing i think they do indigenous day at least and then i'm a thinking it's a little bit more than that but i think it's just kind of getting that ball rolling with yourself i think within every person it's kind of hard to to get going and stuff like that but i think it's i think it's important and i i do appreciate you bringing that up and wanting to talk about that of yeah course, I everything needs momentum you know i've got that oh i'm so sorry brian no, no no no, keep on please. going this happens <laughs> Please. I was just going to point out the little, uh, the little, um, I forget the name of them, but they're these little straps, lax straps. Um, I bought it um, and it's part of the orange shirt society. So there's little ways that you can also do, even if you don't necessarily have a super informed perspective, I just want to call out the orange shirt society as one organization that's really trying to do work. Um, and it's not lacrosse specific, um, but any way that you can really help to shine a light on the fact that there is this history. Um, because when you learn about the history of lacrosse, lacrosse, you will learn about the experiences that indigenous communities had in the past. And it's not something you should shy away from. It's something you should confront, you should understand, you should accept. And it's not something that you can ever place blame or push blame on someone else for, but it's something that you can say, hey, this happened. And reconciliation requires acknowledgement of past events. You know, that doesn't require an apology, but it does require you to say, hey, let's acknowledge that that happened, you know. So that was my tiny little thing about the lax straps. And I totally agree. There are things that organizations can continue to do to make sure more people know about it. But please, Dragon. Yeah. No, I was just going to say uh, that'd be really cool if somehow the MCLA could make it kind of like a requirement um, to just have at least one hour session for each team to just go over the culture of lacrosse. Um, just because I know for myself, I was definitely new to the game and I don't even know when um, the background of lacrosse was actually introduced to me. So it could have been in college. It could have been even after I even played in the MCLA. I can't even remember. Um, So it's such a shame that um, the culture of the sport isn't really discussed that much um, to new people to the game. And I just think that it would be really cool if the mcla or other organizations can make it a requirement for those teams to kind of just like go over the culture go over the history and um give respect to the sport and where it comes from totally agreed we could also go backwards and do like a petition like all the teams sign a petition that they'll hold this for an hour um because that might also sort of like rather than making people feel like the mcla is putting a policy on them it'll be like their peers saying hey this is the right choice like you should do this but totally agreed like as much as we can standardize people learning facts and learning history um because like i don't want to i don't want to disparage social media it's a, it's a great place to spend time it's a great place to to get some great memes uh but sometimes it can inhibit curiosity and inhibit learning new things because you're used to that that just reel of information right at your fingertips. Sometimes the the juicy stuff, the stuff that's really going to be nutritious for your brain, takes a little more work to prep and to find. So, 
Yeah, Sam and I definitely need more nutritious stuff on our social media feeds. <laughs> hey, really quick, is that okay if we transition to a couple questions that I had for you? I feel like our your audience is really going to benefit from a couple of these questions because uh, I'm not sure if they've been asked of you guys. Is that okay or did you have something else coming up? No, let's yeah. do it, Boz. All good, Boz. Okay. So these are my questions for Dragon and Sam. Um, and uh, we'll alternate who goes first. So the, for the first one, Dragon gets to go first. And then after, right. Sam will go first. That sounds good. Um, I don't know if this was a tradition for uh, the Boilermakers, um, but it was for the Ducks on travel games to uh, do uh, freshman karaoke. And TBH, it was not just freshmen. Once the freshmen were done, if it was upperclassmen that wanted to grab that mic and belt some mm -hmm. tunes, they were more than welcome to do so, as long as they were good. And as long as they didn't play anything too horrible, then we cut them off with booze. But hey, that's 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 the way she goes when you're on the stage. So to questions, favorite bus karaoke song by you and by someone else? Oh, man. So I would say one, we did do this, uh, but I believe we just did it one time uh, and it was for all of the new players. They had to do it. So I was a I believe i was about to be a junior when i first joined so for me i did since you've been gone by kelly clarkson um great one but i actually unfortunately one of our teammates uh wills had a uh punctured lung so i changed the lyrics so like since you've been gone wills can't breathe for the first time um <laughs> so like just trying to do a little cover of it uh and that was a big hit and oh my gosh um my favorite that someone else did uh we called him turnip and it was a i believe it was a uh adele song and i can't remember it but it was amazing i was like how does his voice get so high i do not understand <laughs> but it was amazing and then after that we ended up doing additional rounds where like the winner it was basically a battle and then whoever won the battle would have to do a lady gaga song after so <laughs> It was, it was a treat. Honestly, I, uh, falsettos are wild, man. And uh, um, oh shoot, I was gonna say something else. Shoot, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I just hope I hope um, all MCLA teams do bus karaoke because it is a freaking amazing time just to get everyone to bond and then get out of your comfort zone and just be a showman if you can, or just get booed and that's honestly fun too. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a vibe to that. There's a vibe to that. How about yeah. you, Uno? I think um, bus karaoke is one of the greatest things you can do as a team. It was one of my favorite moments. I was always trying to make sure that was getting going. I think I, I think I started it at least once every year I was there. So five years, I at least went on the mic first because you just got to get the ball rolling sometimes. Um, my favorite one I did was Unwritten by Natasha Bedingfield. Um that was just, I feel like everybody was with it. And then, you know, once I hit the spot, I got booed off, but it was good. Uh, and I think my two favorites are, we had this kid, his nickname was Melly. And so he did a YNW Melly song. It was, I don't think it was murder on my mind, but thank God. Uh, but I think it was something else, but it just, it fit. And then this guy, Will Pine, he's one of my best friends um, from Oregon. He did, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to freeze here for a second. I think I'm good. He did um, The Box by uh, Roddy Rich. He was like, but he sang it like the girl who was, who like made a cover of it. And she was like in some, some acoustic wall. And she's like, had to put a stick in the box. Got to get a lick in the box. And that's how he <laughs> sang it the whole time. And everyone was like cringing so hard, but laughing at the same time. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Is that Bus the song Carrier. from the end of Hangover? No, it's, uh, it's like some newer song. It was, it was e er, e er. No, boss, nothing. It's not a click. Nothing. No, you lost you guys, it. I'm usually pretty good with those. You, you guys know, just made me. With, with you guys just made me e er on the. On yeah, the I was just gonna say nothing? our our listeners are also cringing right now. So thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, not a lot flies over my head. I'm pretty tall, but that one got uh, me, man. That damn, one, that damn one flew both right of over. You. That's crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, my favorite one I sang was Brandy, and uh, the oh, favorite one I ever heard was Baby Got Back. Uh, I forget oh. who did it, but everyone jumped in, Baby and it was perfect. That's and incredible. honestly, with a uh, bus karaoke man, sometimes booze are merciful for the singer. Sometimes it's oh, like, thank you. Oh, I didn't really want to do absolutely, that part. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. 
Yeah, it, it's good. It goes both ways. Both of us are like, please just stop. 100 <laughs> percent Favorite uh sideline Selly. Oh, it's gonna be roller coaster, man. Just everybody flopping down and doing the oh <sighs> yeah. I love it. I love I'm glad you went first. Look like Sam needed a second to figure one out. Give me no, what you got. No, I think uh I don't He's think just he not was used there to being on the sideline, in... right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, uh, I think it's a newer one. I don't think it was we did this when I was there, but the corn on the cob when it's like ah, ah, ah. that shit is so so funny i love it it was it was when like a get, when you almost get full a, participation oh yeah when you get the whole the whole sidelines doing it but there's always one kid who's way better than the rest and you absolutely love it but i think that is far and above my favorite celly right now i gotta say either walking the dog or the bench press when, the, when you got Ooh, the rabbit dog on I think, leash or... Okay, that, that one, I, I saw Oregon was doing that last year, and it was cracking me up. You'd hold the kid by the collar or by the, his jersey. That shit was awesome. <laughs> Another honorable mention is the slip and slide. A bunch of guys get on the ground and roll, and someone goes over the top and it's like skids forward. Another good one, too. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> I mean... Horrible for the players, but for yes. the for the sideline where the fans yes. are, electric man. That's absolutely. But right for there. the for the player who's <laughs> got to go over the top and the yeah, <laughs> that's impressive. I'm gonna skip a little because uh, I want to get to some of my my later questions. What's your preferred method of chilling post game? Is it leave me alone? Is it let's kick back with my team or some of my select teammates? Is it let's hit the bars? And if it's let's hit the bars, are you finding the other team for good or bad, or are you not finding them? Brian, I'm gonna let this. Sam go first. Yeah, I'm I'm ready. There we go. Look at that. Absolutely, without a doubt, with the fellows. I don't know what that's gonna be, but I am with the team. And if you're not with the team, fuck you. That's yeah, how I stand. Membership required, and baby. It's it's like I don't care who you are. If I'm telling you we're all gonna be at this house, you better be going to that house. You know, there's always gonna be kids who never go out and whatnot, but like the fringe guys. I want them out every single time. And I don't care if we're going to someone's house just to, you know, have some delicacies with the guys or, you know, you're going to bars and whoever can go to bars, they should be going. I just think those moments, especially after games, win or loss, being with your team is like one of the most important things because I think, one, you get to spend that time talking about the game and talking about, oh, dude, when you did this move, that was so sick or dude, you got roasted, you know, something along those lines. But then it's like you're just spending the time with your teammates, which one, I think you get that, that time during practice, but it's way different outside of that environment, and especially when I think people feel invited. Um, I think that's a big thing. I think at Oregon, you know, we had a lot of clicks, but I think we really tried to, you know, mix those clicks together when when needed. And it just didn't always happen. I felt like we were always like, dude, where is everybody? Like, what could they possibly be doing on a Friday, Saturday night after a win, like without the team? Like that would never even be a thought in my mind. Like, oh, the team's going to go do something. I'm going to go to my girlfriend's house. Like that shit blows my mind. Like, absolutely. Let's go watch Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, I <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but it can't be as much fun as what we're doing. So, yeah, that's right? I, I think w without a doubt should be with the team. Absolutely. And yeah, here comes Brian with it. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> like, leave me the fuck alone. I just want <laughs> <laughs> to be playing video games and eating mac and cheese. Uh, yep. No. So for us, we would definitely just have a kickback. We would go to one of the lacrosse houses um, by the name of Steakhouse. Um, and then the underclassmen will have a Steakhouse Junior. Uh, but typically, we'd try to get everyone to go to Steakhouse. And um, yeah, that was just fun. Just hanging out with the boys, getting into some trouble. Uh, and then for the people who could go to the bars, yeah, just go to the bars. Let's celebrate or just get sad and mope around. But, you know, have some drinks and dance with some random people. Uh, did you guys ever celebrate or go out with other teams for us it was like never really an option because whenever we would play it's just we never at least from my experience we never had anyone just mingle with the opposing teams so I, I would be really curious to know if you guys ever did that or even if honestly like the 
feels like it would be a cool thing if teams would just hang out after the wins or losses. But I don't know why, for some reason, we just never even thought of it. Much more of a beer league men's league pastime, you know, when you're like um, part of that men's league, they'll say, oh, yeah, here's the brewery. Let's all meet up and you'll uh, break bread with the opposing team. In the MCLA, um, I think one example is uh, when we were at the Pac-12 shootout last year and we were staying at a hotel downtown. We uh, a couple times just ran into players from the opposing team. You could tell because they were wearing a sweatshirt or because, you know, lacrosse players sort of have a look sometimes. Um, so you can sort of guess. Um, and it was fun because, you know, it, that was always like meeting someone that has a really weird, weirdly close connection to you, but you don't know them at all. So it's cool to like sit down and talk to them. Um, but there really aren't a huge opportunities amount amounts of that for the MCLA. And I think that is something that could really be beneficial. Um, when you had coach Dan Som, is it Som or Son? Son. S A H Som. Mm. M. Perfect. Uh when, when Coach Som was on, he talked about making travel happen for teams. Um, because one, it gets your players to a different part of the country. Two, it gets you playing a different type of team, um, and hopefully like a different caliber team. And then three, those travel opportunities are those chances where you could potentially t say to the other coach, hey, can we put a dinner together where the two teams meet, um, have dinner, meet each other? Because you never know what's going to manifest from that. One thing that I've always taken from me, taken with me with lacrosse is that it's a really small community and you're always going to know someone else um, in that community once you're a part of it. Um, and you never know when that network is going to come to bat for you. Um, when you walk into an office and someone that you know from lacrosse uh, seven years ago is sitting in that in that office and you've got a friend already. So I, I just feel like that's a really one electric part about lacrosse is that if you've got that in common with someone else, you've instantly got a friendship or at least one commonality where you can start exploring what else you uh, what else you can connect on. Um, so that was great. That was a great answer. Um, what was your favorite skip to do, favorite boss? drill from practice? What's that? What was your favorite thing to do? Hitting the oh, bars, always going kicking back or hitting the bars. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I'm a super extrovert, so I'm ready to go out. If guys are going to go out, like, you know, let's first clean up so we don't absolutely stink and like get yeah. kicked out of the bar. <laughs> right. But let's go out. Let's have some fun. Um, if I ever uh, encountered uh, opposing team players, you know, I'm kind of a... <sighs> I feel like I'm kind of like a, a purist about lacrosse in the sense that I don't try and tr talk trash or tr talk mind games on the field. And I actually like dislike people that do that because I think your play should just speak for itself. Um, and you shouldn't try to use little gimmicks to get an advantage, especially in something that I kind of, I kind of treat lacrosse sacredly. I kind of treat it with a, with a, with a, with a sacred, sacred um, feel to, to it. So if I encounter people that I felt like were, uh, were uh, antagonistic or like villains in the game, I'm going to avoid them. I'm not going to talk to them. But if I see someone that I didn't really know or, you know, maybe did have a positive interaction with on the field, um, you know, I'll, I'll definitely like go over and be like, good game. How was it? How are you feeling? If, if someone got injured, I ask about how they were doing um, anything like that. Um, uh, another fun thing that I can ask Sam about that I can't ask Brian about, unfortunately, because you just never got this opportunity as a player was to stand and banter with your attackman. Um, do you have any most un like ridiculous stories from an attackman trying to get in your head and try and mess with you? Because I've got a couple, and I feel like every defenseman's got a few, and maybe every attackman's got a few about defensemen because I feel like the mind games of defense might oh, be a little absolutely. stronger. <laughs> um, I'll go from both sides. I was never, never antagonistic. I never did that. I would never do that. I respect everybody. Yeah, I'm bullshitting. I absolutely was the kid you hated, Boz. That was me um ever since high school like i used to play lsm and i was like i was like a show every time we had a face off because i'd do something you know something stupid like i'd put my arm around the guy and then i'd go i have a highlight putting my arm around the guy and then i go and de-stick him it was awesome i put my finger up a dude's butt i'm not gonna lie you know i would be the guy to do whatever i could to get them off their game um and then we played nevada i think my super senior year and this kid was like pissing me off so bad and i finally did something where like i took the ball away and cleared it and i came back i said some shit like i'm your biggest nightmare like so just some of the stupidest shit ever and i just remember it like looking back i'm like what an idiot like the dude's like really like come on and i was like damn it like I, i'm such an asshole um and then we played simon frazier that same year i'm not gonna name any names but i was guarding this kid thought he was a fish like i thought he was so bad 
um, ended up scoring a goal. And he's like, yeah, what, like, what's up? And I'm like, dude, like you're, you're bad. Like you're really bad. I wasn't even trying to guard you type shit. And then it just escalated, dude. I've been getting FaceTime calls out the ass in this call. I mean, I've gotten five already. And then you're talking to like, me. My, I, They're like, dude, what is he, what is he telling you? Come yeah, on. I know. <laughs> um, but this kid was like trying to fight me in an MCLA game. Like really like he like head butted me and was like in my face. And I'm like, dude, I'm like four years older than you. I'm ready to get out of this shit. Like, please leave me alone. Um, but I think that's just like, you know, you have those interactions all the time. And I think it can be like one thing and then it turns into some type of argument, um, which I absolutely love. I always am sad of thinking about how more guys weren't like jibber jabbering, you know, like I don't want to do anything physical. Like I'm not going to be a dick in the game and like, s- like really slash you hard. Like that's not me. Like I just love talking shit and i think like sometimes we had a couple games where kids got spit on like kids got like punched and i think that's just like that's Racial not slurs yeah that's just not cool at all um but i definitely it's a, yeah. fuck with the shit shit talking but not once it escalates any farther we don't like that i'm all talk <laughs> no bar- i'm all i'm all uh bark no bite <laughs> As soon as the gate opens, you're like, oh, we can be friends. It's fine. We can- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm backtracking. Yeah. Okay, Boz, I think uh, I, I think so we got to we got to get to a question here because um, also a little pause real quick. I've got like seven more minutes till I need to leave. And so if you okay. guys want to keep going, that's totally cool. Um, But yeah, I've got to go to this fucking coaches meeting. I'm going to. Yeah. Shit is so ass, but there you go. Uh, let's just get to some questions about Boz. And yeah, I got I got like one rapid fire. Boss. Them. Yeah, all right. Mark it. So Boz, you talked a little bit about going from playing to coaching at Oregon, and what was that transition like? I feel like, especially for club, it's a bit different having the players having a lot of power. Um, so what was that like going from player to coach of a team you're you were majority teammates with a year before? Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a learning experience for me. Um, coming in as a grad student and being older than all the guys, I had a little bit of a of a like a older perspective on it. So I think that helped me in the sense of building a relationship that I could easily translate into a coaching relationship. Um, I would characterize myself as a player's coach in the sense that I'm always watching a player's development. I'm listening to a player's feedback. I want to hear what they, what they need from me to get better. I want to make sure it's an active relationship of improvement. Um, and so the fact that I was a player with some of these guys, it didn't seem to affect relationships whatsoever or politics, because I think everyone knew that when they came to me, I was going to give them their my honest opinion and my honest understanding of the team. And they could give me anything. And if they told me that it was in confidence, it's not going to be shared with anyone. Because um, I take trust really seriously. And trust not just in the sense that I'm not going to repeat a secret, but also in the sense that you can trust me to be focused on the things that you guys need to be focused on during these five weeks of practice to get ready for our first game. Um, because as a college student, you know, you're focused on a huge amount of different things and your brain is still developing. So it's a coach's job to go in there and really be that guiding force and that strategizing force. And so it was easy for me to make a transition for that, for that reason, in a sense, because, um, the MCLA at the elite level is very different from high school because these players have a wealth of knowledge to go off of. And that can either be, um, an that can either increase the likelihood that they're going to look at your feedback and pointers and take them in and be coachable, or it'll decrease the likelihood. And so when you talk to a a college player versus a high school player, one, you have to show you're legitimate in the sense that you know what you're talking about and that you can tie it into some deeper facts of the game and into their game specifically so that they can trust that that's something they should take in and, and adopt as part of their game. And I've always been very much about knowing what I'm talking about and giving feedback that actually it's useful for them. So I think they saw me as a player that was really willing to like say something that needed to be said about the way the team was flowing or about the scheme. Um, and so it was really easy to make that transition as the coach. Having Dan, uh, Coach Dan Merritt, as the incoming head coach and bringing a brand new vision also set up the perfect transition for me as a coach um, because I was going to be able to manage this this really close relationship with players and give Coach Dan some information about how the team is doing that he might not get from a player because he's still he's still working on that new relationship and still building those things toward deeper levels of sharing. So I was able to really be a conduit for a new coaching staff. Um, 
And so I really found the transition to be super natural. Like I've, I've always wanted to coach lacrosse ever since I started playing it. I realized there's this, there's this second truth to lacrosse in that if you're not the one on the field, but you're still helping people in the field, you're still part of that, that struggle. And you're still part of that, that victory at the end. And so that's really what, what, what motivates me is the fact that I can take the, all the things that I've learned and all the things that other coaches have given me over the past two decades and give it right back to these players and help them with these little parts of the game that hopefully are going to or put us over the edge and help them reach those effort goals um, that lead to those outcomes that we want for the end of the season. I think it was probably a really easy transition for you because I think everybody respects you. And I think it's that honesty thing where it's like, I know Boz is going to give, like, he's going to shoot it straight to me. You know, I don't have to, you know, the coach isn't worried about how we're going to think about things. I feel like you've got that relationship with the players to where you can just say whatever you need to say and you know there's not going to be like a repercussion because it's just how it is and i think everybody's cool with that hearing that from you you know it doesn't work if it's from everybody but i think it's that it it's that trust factor where it's like i know boss has got my back he's just going to tell me you know if i'm fucking up you know he's going to let me know um so yeah and i think that's something really important like player coaching i think that's i'm the same way and it's like you know, I like I've had those coaches that just yell and scream and don't really connect with you. And that's no fun. I want I'd rather be the coach who doesn't yell as much and is way more in tight, like knows his players. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that's sometimes tough in club lacrosse because you don't always get those good coaches. You get the guys who like to yell and scream. So it's even harder for an elite MCLA program because Oregon has 80 players every year coming out to mm -hmm. try out. So as a coach, you have to be able to filter them out for the talent that you need yeah. Um, and then gracefully and gratefully tell the rest of them that they can play with Hop Valley, the men's league for the year. And then after that, you still have 45 guys that each have a huge host of goals and expectations and dreams for the season because each one of them has that drive to love the game and to get from the game what they want. And it's your job to keep that fire burning, not to let it out, not to fan it too much, to 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 burn out too fast. And that can be a really hard job, especially at the club level and at the college level, because these guys are coming from so many different experiences. They have so many different goals outside of the field. And so sometimes getting them focused on practice or getting them focused on um, the minute parts of the game that are so crucial can be hard sometimes because they're wanting to just go at it at sixes. And it's it's a great problem to have when the guys are just like chomping at the bit to get out there and compete. That's the best, mm -hmm. best problem to have ever. All right, boss. Now, what was the hardest part about playing in the MCLA and what is now the hardest part about coaching in the MCLA? Those are two great questions. Um, thinking back to the year that I played um, with the team, I think the hardest thing was that before playing for the Ducks, I had been pretty accustomed to being on the field a lot um from fourth grade to the end of my uh college career with holy cross um i was pretty much out there you know playing attack playing midi playing defense um just being where i could to help the team and so being in a situation where i could clearly see that there were other players that had spent more time in communities that had more developed lacrosse. They had more skills than I did and they had better instincts than I did. And so it was hard to take that into account um, because I wanted to be a standout player um, that was also from Eugene because I, me personally, as someone who grew up in Eugene, um, I've always wanted to play for the Ducks, um, even though they were a club team and they weren't like the most popular. It was the, it's the pinnacle of lacrosse in Oregon. And so for me, it was always a goal. Um, and so realizing that my role with the team wasn't going to be a starting defenseman or the star faceoff guy or the best, a best man up attackman, knowing that my role was going to be being a really active sideline player being a really critical eye for when things go wrong. What can you glean? What can you understand about what, what happened that went wrong that you can tell your teammate about so that they can hopefully learn for the future? Um, because without that, we're all just going into each game without having learned anything from the previous one. And I think that's one thing that, 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 um, that I took away was that I'm not going to see the field, and that's really hard to swallow for me, but I can absolutely still be a force for good on this team and not make my lack of playing time a problem for others um but i also completely understand now and i'll say that as a coach that's also the hardest thing because as a coach like i said there's 45 players that you're you're 
nurturing and you want to stoke that love for the game. And honestly, one way that you stoke that love for the game is getting them on the field um, and getting them playing time. And when you have a 45 man roster, that's a really hard job. It is a really hard job to get five lines of omitties in and to get the third, the third line of defense in, especially if you want to win the game and you want it to be competitive. So it's balancing that where as a coach, I can see how hard that player is working every week in practice to get better and to be that that um, part of the team to lead us to success and continually having to tell that player, um, because I'm honest, that their skills aren't quite there yet or there are other players on the team that have a more active role because they have more experience and more talent. Um, or it's just a, na a natural fact that I'm not multiple people, so I can't quite figure out the perfect time to do that second line of omitties, and sometimes I'm going to miss it. Um, and so that's the hardest thing because I want everyone to absolutely love their season with us. I want them to love the game, and I want them to take that love that I that I hopefully instill in them and and stoke and give it to others and share with others. Um, and you can't do that if they walk away from the season with a poor taste in their mouth or feeling like their their talents weren't utilized to the best of the team's the team's ability. And so that's really the hardest thing about being a coach is being able to to continue to manage that relationship with a player that hasn't been seeing the field during the season and say to them, like, one, you know, I am your biggest advocate and you know that I'm always going to tell you the truth and I'm going to tell the other players and the coaches the truth too, because I want the best for the team. And I'm here every step of the way to help you with your development and to look for drills, look for ideas, talk to other coaches about things that can really unlock the game for you. Because that's that other job of a coach is to find ways to unlock potential of players that they didn't even realize were there. Um, so that's really the hardest thing is, is, is telling a player who hasn't seen the field yet this season, don't give up, don't lose faith. There is a place for you on this team. And sometimes, sometimes the hardest thing to tell a player is, you know, you have such a, an important role during practice. Because often a player will hear, oh, I'm not important for the game. And that is so far from the truth because those players that might be scoring that goal during the last second of the game, they wouldn't be ready to score that goal or in the, in the place to score that goal without you taking that time during practice to make them better and to be the best possible opponent you can be for them in that practice. So that's, that's the hard thing, but I always try and make sure they see it from the bigger picture and also see that, you know, I'm still playing lacrosse at, at 28, my dad only just recently hung up, hung up his helmet and said he wasn't going to play anymore at 55. Like I see, I see videos on YouTube and, and, and Instagram of 80 year olds out there playing. So like, that's what I want to say to some players is this game is a lifelong relationship and you don't want to, you don't want to lose sight of how beautiful this moment is and how cherished, how much you should cherish this time with your teammates um, because you're focused on what's happening on the field. You're actually not going to remember First and foremost, the things that happen on the field, you're going to remember that bus karaoke song. You're going to remember 2 a.m. going to get Chick-fil-A and sneaking past the coach's door. Those are the things you're going to remember for the rest of your life. And I would hate for anyone to feel like they're missing out on that because of the fact that they feel like they're missing out on the playing time. So I would say that's yeah. the hardest thing about MCLA is playing time, especially at an elite program. You sometimes have to know your role is a little bit more intangible um, than, you know, the MVP of the league. Um, which is really hard, hard to accept sometimes. That was beautifully said. And um, I know for myself, being a kind of small cog in the bigger machine of the team of just either hyping people up or just making sure that I know my role, it's a valuable part. And being able to understand that is so vital just because you have a quote unquote, smaller role for the team doesn't make it any less important. So um, having a coach that can actually advocate for you and then be honest with you is the most you could ask for as a player. So um, it's really great to hear that you are that honest type of coach. And I'm sure that the players that you coach are really proud and honored to have you. Oh, thank uh, you, you. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. You talked a little bit about uh, your life out after MCLA. So can you go more into that? Um, whether is it, are you in a beer league or what is that like? Because I feel like a lot of people who currently are in the MCLA might think that their life in lacrosse is kind of done once they graduate. So I'd love for you to d discuss more about what you're doing now. Yeah, no, I would love to, because I think that there are so many different ways you can connect with lacrosse even after your college career is done. 
first and foremost, go back to those fourth, fifth, sixth graders and coach them first. If you just graduated from the MCLA and you're looking for something to do because you just found your first job and you moved to a new city or you are, you know, still trying to figure out what's what's what you're what you're doing with your life. Go coach youth lacrosse. Go talk to those kids that have been through COVID when they were that age. Help them. Be a mentor. Because I have found that leadership is not about having the 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 characteristics that that I'm exuding right now. It's not about having the joy that is infectious and making everyone laugh. It's being there. It's showing that you care by having a critical eye, by showing that you're invested in that person's development. And that's true at every level of the game. Um, and it's something that I honestly, if I if I could create my development perfectly, I would say that I would have wanted to climb the ranks of coaching to go from youth to middle school, to high school, and then to go to college coaching. It didn't work out that way because I felt like my skills and my and my knowledge was useful for the team and they took me on and that's great. But I think a fresh college graduate should absolutely be spending their time, any free time, in front of the younger generation um, because it, it literally gives you a chance to think about how you're setting an example for other people every day, not just for those little kids, but you'll realize it after you do that. But also... The more people that are invested and putting their time into youth lacrosse across this country, the better lacrosse becomes. And the better we will have the opportunity to watch amazing lacrosse at the D1 level, the higher quality the MCLA will be, and the high school the high schools in your area will immediately experience the benefits of having a robust youth program. Because I could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours about lacrosse, but I will say the most important thing for lacrosse is having a robust youth program in your community, because that is your pipeline for players. If you don't have players who have engaged with lacrosse and understood it and gotten better before they've hit their first day of high school, your high school is at a disadvantage. And your high school is actually going to miss out on other potential players who are playing other sports because their friends won't have been playing lacrosse until after their freshman year, and they won't know about it. And then they'll already be set in their ways with playing a certain sport. And for one, I want people to know about lacrosse because like I said, earlier it might prevent head injuries unfortunately american football is very dangerous for the for, for for the younger generation cte is being found in people younger than 35 and younger than younger than 30 so i just think about the younger generation want them to play a sport that does keep them healthy and active and hopefully it's super competitive but also is hopefully less dangerous and i won't say lacrosse isn't dangerous oh my god injuries happen every day and it's important that you practice safe lacrosse and that you're always looking out for your teammates and your opponents um but it's, in my opinion, so much safer than the micro concussions you get through football. And, you know, the bottom line is if we have more people coaching youth lacrosse, we'll have more players playing youth lacrosse, which means in three years, we'll have more high schoolers, which means the high school level gets better. And it's just a self-feeding cycle. Um, I see too often youth programs or high school programs that are totally um, reliant on parents to get the lift off the ground. And again, the youth program is how to address that problem because it's not like there's any other alternative to parents, but you need more and you need a consistent stream. Because unfortunately, coaches don't always have the resources to continue to develop a program year to year and they need that parent connection. Um, and the only way that you'll have continuity because that happened to me high school i graduated and our program suffered unfortunately because we didn't have a large amount of a large amount of a freshman class coming in so it's always about having a continuous stream of players and those parents who understand the game understand how much their kids love the game and that they want to make sure the game is played at a really high level mm -hmm. um because like i as a kid was always super sad that i didn't, didn't get to play lacrosse um d1 and i had this belief that it was because i grew up in eugene and that's just not true anyone from anywhere in the country can become an absolutely insane athlete and also get good at lacrosse well enough to go try out for a d1 program um but at the same time, I would love for every community to have the opportunity for a kid to play lacrosse from at least third, fourth grade, all the way through high school. That's yeah. the dream. Honestly, the best fundraising things that we did at uh, Purdue was just playing with the youth youth teams, like having a youth team come over and then just being able to coach them and teach them. So it does start from the bottom and the young age. And if they develop well, then it's going to increase the games at every single level going forward so yeah if you want to have an impact you start with the younger kids that's who you want to start with that's yeah. the, those are the kids who are looking up for role models and the more you can be a positive role model and to show 
kids something you love and that it can benefit them, better off we'll be. Yeah. Now, Boz, that leads us into our final question. So what advice do you have for these younger kids, these high school lacrosse players, thinking about playing in college? Oh, man, I, I wish I could go back in time and be one of these again, because it's such an exciting time to be seeking out the opportunity to play lacrosse. Um, if you're in high school, I hope you're hitting the wall every day um, with both hands and behind the back. I hope you're watching as much lacrosse as you can um, on social media. I hope that's all the accounts you follow. Um, and what I hope you're doing is thinking, like I said earlier, about how you approach the game. Um, because the game is a miniature version of life. You will face all the adversity that you will face in life during a lacrosse game. And how you have faced that adversity, how you confront it head on and learn from it, will change how you um, approach the rest of your life and tackle the biggest problems that you'll face. Um, and so in high school, first off, lean in, enjoy the ride, like don't be hyper focused on college because you think it'll be this amazing experience that might be true but it might not so so take every moment um at, not for granted enjoy everything cherish it um a lot of folks on this podcast have had really good advice about making sure that uh the college you choose isn't just because of lacrosse it should be because you see a future because of that diploma you should feel you should find a program that you like that you enjoy whether it be engineering, whether it be political science or economics, um, it, anything, but make sure that the academic program that you're signing up for is the one that you're going to be using, using long-term, um, because learn from my mistake. You know, I, I did poli sci because I found it to be a compelling thing to talk about. Um, but no one wants to pay you to talk <laughs> except for podcasts <laughs> like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not usually about politics. Wait, so we're getting paid. My, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you guys are getting paid. <laughs> Some of my favorite movies were the Millers. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, don't take for granted the, the high school experience, but absolutely be picky about the college you go to. Oregon is a great place to go to college because it has a great business school. It has a great law school. It has a great um, digital media, law, digital media school. I'm sure there are many other schools that I'm not calling out. They'll be mad at me for not talking, talking about them when I go to practice. But the, the, the programs are the first step. Second step is how far do you want to go? Do you want to go outside your state? Can you do that? Can you do that financially? Do you want to start looking at scholarships and those kinds of opportunities right now? Because the earlier you do that, the better you're off. Every dollar you get approved for with scholarships is money in that plane ticket to go to a place you want to go to. And that's how you should think of it. You shouldn't think of it as I'm going out of state. It's so expensive. I got to go take all these take all these loans out. Fine. If that's what you have to do to do that thing that you want to do, do it. But you should take advantage of every scholarship you can. Um, so that's that second thing of location. Because like I, I grew up on the West Coast, but my parents were from the East Coast. I always wanted to experience the East Coast. And so I knew I was going to be going to the East Coast for college. So I applied to a bunch of different East Coast schools, tried to prep as much as I could for scholarships. I know if my mom sees this, she's going to laugh at that super hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely think actively about how far you want to travel and recognize that that's going to be every break. If you want to go home, you got to hop on a plane for Christmas break. And that was something that I didn't quite think about when I went to Massachusetts um, that got pretty annoying by the fourth year. <laughs> yeah. um, and then finally, finally, after all of that, then you think about the lacrosse program. How developed is it? Is it the elite level that you're looking for? Are you looking to be a national championship contender in the MCLA? Are you looking for a D Division three NCAA team to try out your skills and maybe see if you're good enough? And if not, you can always transfer. There are, there are a million transfers out there too. So don't feel like the choice you make today is the choice you have to stick with tomorrow. Um, everyone is on their own path and you don't owe anyone anything um, in that sense of, oh, I'm beholden to this team because I picked it. What are you talking about? Go get your bread. If there's a team that you're going to fit better on, do that. If there's a program you like better, transfer because we only have one of these lives. So so do the most you can with that time. Um, but that's why I call it, make it part of your college triangle. There should be the triangle of school, extracurriculars, and then taking care of yourself. And if you're wanting to be in a part of an elite college program, that is going to take up 30 to 35 hours a week of your time. We're not a D1 program, but that is absolutely how much time our players have to devote each week to practice and to preparing for games, or else we aren't going to be the competitive team we want to be at the end of the season. 
Um, and so those are things that you just have to acknowledge. Like the guys that are part of the team, um, we have frat at, we have frats and sororities at Oregon. It's a very strong Greek life, but we're honest with players, the, the officers, not me, because it is a player run organization, like Sam said. Um, so coaches are hired by the players and they're there to, to facilitate the player's experience. Um, but they'll tell people that have um, tried out, if you go for an officer position at a frat, I don't think that there's a place for you on the team because you can't balance those time commitments. So if you're someone who's really social and maybe thinks frat or Greek life is going to be closer to your uh, goals and make for a better college experience, then there might be a men's league out there for you to play a few games every spring um, and still get that college experience. So I think everyone has to, when they're in high school, first off, I know it's a scary thought, but try and think about what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And don't think about like, I have to make this choice for the rest of my life. I've changed my mind like 20 times in the past eight years. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone can figure it out. And I mean, like there's so many success stories. When did Oprah start six, her success, like at 45 or 47. something. So yeah. don't feel like you have pressure to make a decision or stick to it. Um, but do what's right for you. Do the thing that's going to set you up for success because lacrosse is that microcosm of life and every bit of adversity and struggle that you experience in lacrosse is going to translate to how you tackle the rest of your life. So if you want to be part of an elite college program, definitely understand um, how much of a time commitment it is. Understand that even if you do all of that, you might not see the field and that's okay. Like, unfortunately you have to be okay with that because sometimes your role is an absolutely amazing player during practice to help those players that do unfortunately get the field um, to be that level of preparedness and that level of talent that they can do their best work. Um, and so it's, it's, it's all of those things. And I, I don't, I don't envy the, the situation that high schoolers are in these days because they've been through something that I could never imagine with COVID. I could never imagine having to experience that during my high school or middle school years and how it would change my outlook on the future. Um, but I hope that they know that even if they don't know me, they can always reach out to me for guidance. Like, like they can, they can find me on Insta and direct message me. Um, and there are people also near you that you can talk to as well. Like never feel like you can't bring something up to a coach that you trust. If you have a coach that you have a trusting relationship with, you can bring anything to them and they'll support you. Um, so never feel alone in the struggle of decision-making or in the struggle of your development, because there are people that if you are honest with them and show your, show your weakness, that is a strength. Don't anyone ever tell you that emotions or showing weakness is actually a weakness. It's not. That's honesty. And that's always a strength. So... That's a little bit. Um, the final thing is if a college lacks recruiter or coach is slow or late to respond consistently over time, do read into it. Um, because I've seen the case of a, a bunch of really awesome um, programs that have great social media um, stuff going on, but then you try and reach out to their coach and it's crickets. Um, and that's going to speak to how the coach approaches practice and how they approach games. Um, because I will say that any coach that isn't taking seriously the recruiting process and the recruiting system, they are not doing their job to the full, full extent and capabilities. Um, because it's not like we can offer a scholarship, but we can offer a relationship so they know how the, how the team is doing. They know what the team is about and they know um, all of these intangibles before they come to campus. Um, and that only happens because a coach answers the phone and talks to a parent or talks to a prospective player. Um, and so if you're a prospective player and you're not having a great relationship with a recruiter or a coach, you probably should just take that into consideration as this might be something that continues to happen over the course of my career. And do I want a coach who's going to be listening and taking my information in or not? So that's just like one of the things where I, I try to, I try not to, I try not to um, make conclusions about people's intentions, but I do try to understand what their priorities might be because of their choices. You know, like I always want to trust someone's intentions that they're not doing something, you know, in a negative intention. Um, but you've got to do what's right for you. So that was a lot of advice at a very high speed, but I hope that it resonates with them. I'm sh sure it absolutely does. Wow. Thank you so much, Boz. That is it for our interview. That was amazing. I'm sure we're going to have you back on probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, for the listeners out there, we would love to do an episode about the history and culture about uh, lacrosse in general. So uh, stay tuned for that episode. Before I go, 
VCL squad. Happy New Year, everyone. See you on the flip side. All right, so that's it for our exclusive interview with the buys. Up next is our final segment. And for this segment, for this episode, it's going to be our New Year's resolutions. So, Sam, what is your New Year's resolution? I got a few just like generalized things that just to clean up my life, you know. Um, But I'm going to go with a fact that I need to watch which is all, I mean, this is generalized as well, but I need to watch more lacrosse this year. I think whatever level that may be, but specifically NCA division one and club, I feel like I do watch a decent amount of club, but now that we're here, I feel like I gotta, you know, stay in on business and I gotta start watching some more games, even if it doesn't apply to Oregon. Cause that's normally what I've been watching. I've been watching PNCL teams try and keep up with that. But I think it's just got to expand a little bit. Like, I'll watch. Uh, I'll watch my Illinois boys, and I'll watch my. I can't remember what other team I got, um, but I'll watch that team. I'll watch them both. I think it's Montana State, and I just think it's it's better for us and it's better for everybody if we just start watching a little bit more lacro- lacrosse. And I was talking to uh, one of my coaches I coach with at the high school team I'm at, and he, I was like, "Yeah, I don't really watch." NCA college games. He's like, you don't watch that. He's like, you need to. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna start doing it. So, mm-hmm. I think uh, it's just it's just healthy. It's a healthy thing. Healthy, healthy to watch lacrosse. Healthy to watch good lacrosse. And I think that can just help everybody just by learning some things. And you don't gotta take notes, but mental notes, you know. Yeah. That's well, that's mine, Brian. What are you thinking? Uh, that's a great resolution to have. I definitely need to watch more lacrosse as well. Um, and I think for me, I have a couple, um, one would be to just create more content, whether that being more content for the podcast, um, but also maybe creating my own short films. Um, and okay. Yeah. More things to establish myself in my career as an actor. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but another fun one is I want to be able to dunk comfortably. So, <laughs> yes, I'm, sir. I'm not talking about, you know, the little finger roll and then grab the rim. That's what I can doesn't currently count. do now. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't count. So, you know, <laughs> I'm going to work on getting my my hops up, you know, I'm 28. I'm almost in my 30s. I, I got to, you know, achieve my prime before my get my back gets blown out so <laughs> oh, fucking... <laughs> yo hey yo <laughs> gotta get those hops up man dude those That's are it. those are two great ones i think the first one for you is awesome just trying to get that resume type shit going you know mm-hmm. and then dude the dunk you gotta get there i'm rooting for you so hard right. like i feel like you get it i get it too yeah so i'm i'm happy I'm ready. I'll start. I'll update you every week. I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll send you texts every week. Ooh. Let's go, Brian. You got this shit. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Dunking actually is tough though. Like, like unless you're you've just got the height you, and you can just do it. You got some long mm-hmm. arms, long legs. But like six yeah, two a- even is like you're not like expected to be able to dunk. You know. But I don't know. I feel like people people they like if you are six two, they're like you should be able to dunk. Like if you have a somewhat like athletic frame they're like why aren't you dunking that is um, a fair point but it is like it's i feel like more of like having so much mass it's just i mean i, I got some muscle mass you know so yeah, having, having that large frame it's uh it will hinder your jumping ability so you know i want to i want to work on that yeah i feel that all right me too then i'm gonna I'm a try and dunk now Hell my, yeah. my 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 20 inch vertical yeah we got Eight inch start, rims, baby. You gotta, yeah, I'm, I'm into that. <laughs> eight, foot, not eight inches. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> I'll take either. <laughs> all right, guys. That's all for this episode of the Varsity Club Across Podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to tune in next time for more exciting content about the world of club lacrosse. You can follow us on Instagram at Sam underscore Chris Cola and at Brian Plunkett Lopez. Thanks for listening. And also, do you want know to comment your New Year's resolutions below? I want to to see what's out there. Do you want to dunk? Do you want to... Who knows? Quit drinking? Figure it out. Figure it out. Let us know.